Hello, church. Welcome to the weekly growth devotional. Wasn't the 30-day growth challenge just incredible? I hope you really felt like you got something from it. I mean, you were drinking water. We were joining together in prayer. We were teaching straight out of the Bible, verse by verse. It was a blast. I loved it. And I really hope you did the same. Let's go ahead and invite the Holy Ghost for you at home. We've done it already here on the set, but let's invite the Holy Spirit to be with you as we invite the teacher for the word. Holy Spirit, we thank you, God, for these few moments. God, I thank you, Jesus, as we read your word, that you'd illuminate it to us. Spirit of God, teach us. This is your book. We submit to your teaching. Amen. All right, so we're in Ephesians chapter 2. Let's get it rolling. Amen. So this obviously is coming, kind of rolling back into it after the 30 Day Grow Challenge. Ephesians is talking about uh, Paul talking to the Ephesian church, obviously, Church of Ephesus. And he's addressing them about many, many things. I know that Christy already had a word that was on that, on Ephesians 1. But this is a powerful book. This is a lot about the victories you've made in Christ, who you are in Jesus. This speaks specifically about the benefits of the cross, about what it means to be in Christ, um, what it means to have all of the benefits that Jesus gives you because of the cross. So we're in celebration time in Ephesians. It's an incredible book. Uh, Paul prays for people in this book multiple times. He prays in multiple times, not just scriptures, but it's actual prayers that you can read, that you could pray over yourself through this book, that Paul prays for you, that your eyes would be enlightened, that you'd know the hope of your calling, that uh, he prays and just tells you about the nature of Jesus, that he does exceedingly above all we could ask or think. And I mean, in these few chapters, there's six chapters in this book, it is packed. We all ending the book, obviously, with the famous putting on the armor of God and uh, being known how to then do spiritual warfare. So there's a lot covered in this entire book, but I'm just going to go chapter two with you. Let's read from the beginning. Read right through the book. I'm going to uh, highlight a couple things. I won't say everything, um, but uh, we want you guys to study on your own and obviously get a lot out of this. So once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, this is Paul talking. This is verse one. You used to live in sin. Just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers of the unseen world. So another translation says that the devil is the commander of the world. So it, he, he's the ruler of this present age. In Corinthians, it talks about the devil is the ruler of this present age. So if you are not sold out to Jesus and you don't know Jesus, the devil actually is your boss. He is in rulership of your life. When you're not saved, you're not redeemed, meaning you're not bought back, meaning that Jesus has no legal rights to you because you have not submitted to his leadership and you have not been covered by the blood of Jesus. Therefore, the devil owns you. The devil is the God of this world. He is the God of this world. Even though God created the world, the devil is the God of this world in this present age. The Bible doesn't talk about, and this is something to understand, the Bible talks in ages. We talk in years millenniums, um, centuries, decades, things like that. But the Bible doesn't talk in those terms. It talks in ages. So in this present age, the Bible says that the devil is the God of this present age, of this, the world in this present age. But there will be a new age, a new age that comes, obviously when Jesus takes us all up to heaven and all that great stuff happens. But just realize that if you're not obeying the Lord, if you're not unified with Jesus, you are obeying the devil you are unified with the world. And the Bible says in Ephesians later on in, verse, in chapter 4 that to be a friend of the world is to be an enemy of God's. And so this is really incredible how he's opening this up. He's saying, listen, you used to be this way, but you don't got to live this way anymore. You're not owned by the devil anymore. You're owned by Jesus. He, the spirit of the world, is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. So the devil is the spirit that's at work in rebellion. Another word for that is rebellion. Rebellion is um, a sign of the old nature. It is who you are. You are a rebel. Every single one of you who are saved was a rebel. Every one of us have a rebel that's living on the inside of us. Understand that even when you get saved, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, you're made a new creature. All old things are passed away and everything's become new. But please understand that you still have a rebel who's living on the inside of you. It's called the old man. It's called the flesh. 
But once you're saved and the Holy Spirit comes upon you in power, you have the ability to keep him under subjection. Paul says, I put my body under subjection that lest I go to the end and be a castaway at the end of this entire life of ministry because my body got me into trouble. My old nature, my flesh ruled my life. He said, I'm not going to allow that to happen. I have a choice in this. I'm going to put my body under subjection. So we got to understand here that we have the Spirit of God in us that now tells that rebel to be quiet. You're not going to be rebellious anymore. You're under subjection. You're not ruling my life anymore. God is ruling that. I'm the one who has the say in this. Hallelujah. Verse 3, all of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires, inclinations of a sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. Wow. We were just like everyone else. You were just like, were just like everyone else, a sinner just like everyone else. But when you got saved, you're no longer a sinner. I understand that you still sin, but you are not characterized as a sinner anymore. You are a child of God, your royalty, your royal priesthood, a holy nation set apart for God. You were consecrated, the Bible says, consecrated the moment you got saved. God consecrated you toward a purpose. You now have a purpose. So don't be saying, oh, I'm just a sinner and, you know, Lord knows. No, you're not. No, you're not. You're not you don't have the same nature anymore. Yes, you could still sin, but you are sinning less. Hallelujah. But God is so rich in mercy and he loves us so much, verse 5, that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved, by God's incredible two-part, grace is two parts, unmerited favor, supernatural ability that goes beyond your own ability in order to empower you to do God's will. Because of that, because of that twofold thing called grace, you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms. Oh my gosh. <laughs> because we are united with Jesus. You're united with Christ. Now you're no longer seated where you are. You, okay, let me try to explain this. I am seated in my chair right now. I'm in pastor's office in our San Bernardino Hallmark location of our church, okay, for the Wayworld Outreach. But in the spirit, I'm not seated here. In the spirit, I'm seated in heaven with God. That means as far as the spirit realm, the angels and demons are concerned, they see where I'm actually seated. The devil sees where you're actually seated but he depends on your ignorance. He depends on you not knowing who you are in Christ because we're not in the Word of God. You don't know where you're seated, therefore you're acting like he's still able to have influence in your life. Y'all, you're not seated here. You're seated in heavenly places with God. You're a son and daughter of the King. You are royalty. You are seated in heavenly places. Understand that if he's seated there in authority and everything is under his feet, you're seated there with him in authority. Everything is under your feet. Wow. So God can point to us in all future ages, there's that word ages again, as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness toward us as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ. Now understand, we get all of these things. Paul is emphasizing again, all of these benefits are just because of Jesus. It's not because of you, it's because of who you're united with. It's because of who you are found in. You are hidden in Christ. Therefore, you're getting what Christ deserves. Do you understand that about the cross? That Jesus took everything you deserved and then you get to have everything he deserves. Let me say that again. On the cross, Jesus took all the guilt, shame, sin, and everything that you deserve so that after the cross, you get to have everything he deserved. It's the message of the bundle. That's the cross. Wow. So now that you're found in Christ and you're united with Jesus, you get these benefits. It's because of who you're hooked up to. You ever had a friend who was like, 
super popular or wealthy or had the hookups and all these places you want to go, you couldn't have gotten there. But because you have a friend who can get there, you're invited in. You can go to that, you know, that party. You could go to that, uh, you know, festival. You could go backstage. You know, you get to get in that place and meet that person because you have a friend who is connected to him. Think about that. Jesus, the Son of the Father. Because we know him, we get everything. And God goes a step past that. He didn't just say you're a friend. He says, I'm going to make you a son. I'm going to put you in my family to get everything that my son has. You're my son now. You're my daughter. How beautiful. For we are God's masterpiece. Wow. You are God's masterpiece. You're not a mistake. You're not a failure. He just called you a masterpiece. You're not a mistake. You're not a failure. I don't care where you were born. I don't know how you grew up. You're not a mistake. You're not a failure. You are a masterpiece to God. I wish I could go into that word masterpiece, but we don't have time. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus. That's when you got saved, brand new. So we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. You see, without the help of Jesus, without being found in Christ, without the Holy Spirit in your life, you can't do the things he's planned for you. You have to get hooked up to the right source. You've got to have the right friend in Jesus. You've got to get a part of the family. Verse 11, I'll go quick now. Don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. You were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews who were proud of their circumcision, even though it affected only their bodies and not their hearts. In those days, you were living apart from Christ. You were excluded from citizenship among the people of Israel, and you did not know the covenant promises God made to them. You lived in this world without God and without hope. He's describing our situation where we were before Jesus. But now you have been united with Christ. There it is again. Once you were far away from God, but now you've been brought near to Him through the blood of Jesus. Once again, because of Jesus, because now you have a connection to Jesus, you're also close to the Father. For Christ himself brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people when in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. Oh my gosh. Do you know why prejudice does not exist in the kingdom of heaven? Do you know why skin color is not the same, not seen the same? Let me just say this. God is not colorblind. I know people want to say that to try to make people feel better, but that's not the truth. God's not colorblind. He's color coordinated. He's not ashamed of the way he created you. He actually celebrates it. There is no racism. There is no class racism. There's no this per this, these are my people. There's a, you know why? Because the moment Jesus' body was destroyed, as his body was being destroyed, he was destroying the walls between us. The walls that come between us of skin color and racism. The wall that comes between us of hostility between brothers and sisters. The walls that come between us of classes and, and people and sex and cliques. All that stuff doesn't exist in Christ. That's why the gospel is the answer for every prop. The gospel is the answer for racism. The gospel is the answer for hate. The gospel is the answer for all uh, wars. The gospel because in Christ you're all equal. Nobody's better than anybody. You're all God's favorites when you're in Christ. You're all seen as the family. Amen. He did this by ending the system of law and the commandments and regulations. Here we go. Verse 18. Now all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ done, has done for us. All of us get to come to God now. Last couple verses. Verse 19. So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers or foreigners. You are citizens along with all God's holy people. You are members of God's family. Why is he talking to the Gentiles as foreigners? Because the gospel was only meant for the Jews. At the beginning, it was only being preached to for the Jews. Jesus went to the Jews. Uh, Peter was going to the Jews. But Paul was the first one who God said, I want you to go to the Gentiles, the people outside of the Jewish community that also get to get the gospel because this gospel isn't just for the Jews. It's for everyone. So now he's speaking to them and he's saying, you're no longer outsiders. You're just like us. Together we are his house built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets and the cornerstone in Christ Jesus himself. My wife included this in her vows that she said to me when she said our marriage was coming together. She said, we will be, she looked at me in the face, she said, we will be a house built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. It's going to make me a little emotional. And the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself for this marriage. I remember her saying that to me. We are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple of the Lord. Through him... 
You Gentiles or you who are far away, do you know you and me are the Gentiles? We're not the Jewish people. We're the Gentiles. We're the outsiders, but no longer are we outsiders. So he's speaking to us. Through Jesus, you and me are also being made part of the dwelling where God lives by his Spirit. You are now the house of God. Isn't this a great chapter? Just thank the Lord for his goodness to you. I love Ephesians. And I really pray you get a lot from this in your groups. Go deeper into these things. God bless you. See you next week. See you at church. Thank you for being a part of this beautiful family. God bless.